What's going on, everybody? This is the SI Sooners Podcast. Josh Calloway in Oklahoma City. Ryan Chapman in Norman. John Hoover in Tulsa. Episode 107. Guys, how are we doing? We still don't have Caleb Williams or Jackson Dart news. I feel like a, a fool once again, but here we are. How are we feeling? You guys have both healed up, I hope. Everybody feeling healthy and closer to 100% as we uh, get ready to move into February. Who says no? A little bit. A little bit better. Ryan, I, feel, I know you're better. Yeah, yeah, I feel much better. I was going to say, Hoove has been uh, assaulting our ears in the pre-show pillow fight here with some uh, bodacious coughs that have come out. They're they're violent. They're aggressive. No. It's, just but... a, it's just annoying. It's just a little annoying tickle. As you breathe in, it's like... <laughs> I just, I, it's so annoying. I don't have any other symptoms. I'm just, I'm done with being sick, except for this stupid cough. Look, I'm, I'm right. just hoping that you at some point last week sent a video of our last podcast <laughs> just with no sound and was like, it sounded okay, but look at how sick you and I are. So hopefully yeah, we avoid that funny. fate this week. Yeah, well, it's hilarious. Like I'm talking. I didn't really notice because I was talking, but then you guys are over there just like, <laughs> like, uh, like a silent movie of like sick terrible. people like yeah. be a sick be a sick person in, in a silent movie that's like what you're doing <laughs> i woke up this morning with a, a little bit of a scratchy throat like a tiny bit and i thought oh no but then i realized that i just basically screamed for an hour and a half last night doing basketball. <laughs> had, an, had an insane double overtime game it was unbelievable and I already feel it already went away. So I, I'm good. I'm, I remain healthy. I persevere on. I've never tested positive for COVID or anything for that. This whole I I probably you, you assume you've had it at this point, but I never did test positive. I've been tested a few times where I thought I might have and I never did. So I'm a miracle. I'm a miracle child, I guess, or something. But anyway, we press on episode 107. I said it right at the top and we'll, we'll talk about it a little but there's not much new. Uh, Caleb Williams and Jackson Dart still haven't said anything. It's crazy. I said two weeks ago on this show, there's no way we get to the next show without news. Well, we're now two shows later. We still don't have any news on this front. Um, it seems to me, that, uh, as we've gone on here, it seems that the, the theory or the idea that Jackson Dart is waiting for Caleb Williams certainly holds more water, at least in my opinion, because the, we, ju we just keep going. And, now this rumor comes out yesterday. It's been it's been floating. It's not like it was brand new yesterday, but it seemed to really pick up steam that Caleb Williams is seriously considering Wisconsin, which is crazy. They don't, in my opinion, seem to check any box. Uh, they don't have an offensive-minded head coach. They don't present a lot of NAL opportunities out there in yeah. Wisconsin. They don't pose an obvious championship contender. I mean, they might be pretty darn good, but a championship contender, I don't know about that. And then, you know, I don't know how many Wisconsin NFL QBs are there. Like none. I mean, Russell Wilson's about it, and he doesn't even really count. And he was a grad transfer, so um, just you know, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll kind of get into the angles of it. But just first off, and who you can start, just kill Williams to Wisconsin. What do you make of that? Does that make any sense to you? And if he does that, the conversation kind of spins to. Is Oklahoma feel silly? Does Lincoln Riley feel silly? Who should feel sillier? It's it's a wild it's a wild deal if that's the way we head here. I I really don't know what to make of it because, like you yeah. said, Wisconsin has no pedigree putting quarterbacks in the NFL, and that's what Caleb Williams' number one goal is: is to major in football and get to the professional football league, uh, where he can make millions of dollars being an NFL quarterback. Okay. Wisconsin, uh, you know, Sam Mays on my, on my show every day, we've talked about this a couple of times this week. It makes sense from a quarterback safety kind of position where, because they put five guys in the NFL every year, it seems from the offensive line, they've got uh, good mm -hmm. tight ends that have come through there. They've got good players. They've got a, a thousand yard running back or sometimes a 2000 yard running back who come behind, who, who play behind the quarterback and, and give him, a lot of security blankets. That's a lot of security blankets for a quarterback. Is it enough to make you want to transfer to Wisconsin if you're the number one player in the country and a, and a Heisman front runner? I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, right. You know, security and, and safety and all that, that doesn't sound like Caleb Williams at all. He wants to be the guy. He wants to be, you know, Hollywood. Uh, he wants to be out in the spotlight. Um, 
I don't think he's motivated by winning a Big Ten championship or, you know, which is something that Wisconsin doesn't do a lot of. I just, it's, it's very curious to me. I get the whole thing about playing behind a bunch of great offensive linemen. Bro, you go up there, it's like 15 degrees in November and the wind is blowing and you're in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a w- lovely town, a great place. I'd love to visit there. But your quarterback numbers are down in at Wisconsin historically everybody says the quarterbacks are no good maybe the weather's no good and doesn't allow for good downfield forward passing right. i mean that's that's something to consider you know look at the down the street a little bit i know the packers have had a couple of great quarterbacks in in wisconsin but over in chicago they're on the lake chicago quarterbacks have stunk for 70 years um buffalo quarterbacks they're on one of the lakes Buffalo quarterbacks before this last few years, Buffalo quarterbacks have never been any good. Cleveland is right on the Great Lakes. Their quarterbacks have always stunk before Baker Mayfield got there. And, you know, he didn't have the greatest year being injured and all. I'm just saying that area of the country doesn't promote prolific quarterback play. And if you go up there, there's going to be a reason why you only have like 1,800 yards passing and 17 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. Right. And like I said, you have you have Russell Wilson who – uh you know, obviously he's a fantastic NFL quarterback, but he wasn't really, you know. Transfer from NC State. Yeah, he wasn't really built there, obviously. And he it's not like he was even a high draft pick. He was like in the third third round or so. It's not like he moved up to number one. I have a hard time yeah. picturing a Wisconsin quarterback being number one, um, or which is what Caleb Williams obviously wants. Ryan, I mean, Wisconsin, what do you make of it, I guess? You know, is this – who looks hey, – that's kind of the thing. Is like, does it make oh, you look – bad does it make Lincoln Riley look bad like it, it's a weird thing if this actually happens no I, I don't think it really makes OU look bad just because it was clear he was going to enter the portal and test the waters and I think there was a window there at the beginning of this whole ordeal where Oklahoma was in and actively saying you said you were going to give us a chance we want you back all this stuff it really feels like guys at some point OU is just like screw this we're good we got Dylan Gabriel we have Nick Evers, as we'll speak on in a little bit. Jack Snardle is now in pocket, in tow for 2023. We don't have to play this song and dance. I feel like that's what Oklahoma did. And so as a result, I don't know how Oklahoma can look bad unless um, you wanted the coaching staff to wait around for a month because because that's what was going to have to happen is to, to play this game every day for a month. It sounds like they just moved on. So I don't think Oklahoma looks bad. Right. Um, USC, it'll be really interesting because there was that weekend where Caleb Williams posted the photo from the Rams game and the Lakers game, right? And then immediately after that, the smoke you heard was Caleb Williams is not impressed with USC's facilities at all, which is funny because if he was willing to take the visit and willing to make amends or whatever with Lincoln Riley for leaving you high and dry, all this stuff. That would be a massive blow, I think, to USC because they have the NIL, they have the location, they have the coach with that pedigree. They just probably don't have the roster in place right now. So I think that if anyone looked right. bad coming out of all this, it, it would be USC. As far as a, 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 does it make any sense? Like, yes, he's protected, like you said, John, but but it, does anyone believe that Wisconsin's suddenly going to open things up and, and let Caleb Williams – you know, run the show and be anything but a game manager. No, he just might be the greatest game manager in the history of football um, with how Wisconsin's going to do it. So the only thing that makes sense is he clearly wants to be as close to Aaron Rodgers as possible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe we'll see how long Aaron Rodgers is, is there. Um, you know, that that's a conversation for a dip for a, for a Packers podcast. Um, you know, the Jackson dart part of it, because obviously we're sitting here waiting for Jackson dart and, it seemed like he was trending toward OU, but it's like as more time goes on, you start to lose a little bit of faith in that. Do you think it, it might just be that Caleb Williams, if he goes to Wisconsin, Jackson Dart, just going to say, well, I didn't really want to leave USC anyway, and he just goes back to USC, and that's kind of that. Is is that a situation you could kind of see unfolding? Yeah, I, I read somewhere on Twitter today, people get smart alecky on Twitter, and it's all good fun. But uh, somebody said that Lincoln Riley tried to run Jackson Dart off and now he's asking him to come back. Uh, hey, wait, don't go anywhere. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not done yet. Um, it's a little tongue in cheek, obviously, but there's sure. also a kernel of truth possibly behind that. Um, so Jackson Dark, maybe, you know, he's got some options. Uh, I don't know if Oklahoma is at the forefront of his options. It still sounds like he's thinking Ole Miss. 
Uh, sure sounded like BYU got interested in him uh, and the interest was was mutual. So a little bit of vice versa there going on. And he may be looking at, you know, greener pastures here and there. Doesn't sound like he wants to go back to USC. It sounds like the family is really done with Lincoln Riley and USC. So uh, I would I would look for that to not happen. Mm. Not not going to rule it out, but at the same time, you know, kids got to make a business decision and co- uh, playing for a coach who's put guys in the NFL like Lincoln Riley has, that's a business decision. So don't get don't let it get personal. Make a good business decision. I think Jackson Dart probably had his feelings hurt as well as the family uh, from all from all indications. But uh, it sounds right. like that's something that is probably not going to happen. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see. Um, maybe by next week's show, we'll, we'll know where <laughs> Kayla Williams or Jackson Dart is. I don't know. Uh, I'm not guaranteeing anything anymore. Um, no telling. No telling with these guys. And uh, I guess we'll see. We continue to trudge through. It's going to be February. We don't know where these guys are headed. Spring football is not that far away. And uh, look at it this way, to too. By the time next week's show comes along, for Oklahoma specifically, the, the ad drop date, will be passed for late enrollment, adding classes, all that stuff. So right. I, I know this is, they don't come to play school, all that stuff. But again, at some point you have to be enrolled at the university you want to play football at. <laughs> so you can go through spring football. Like you have, you have to be a student at that school to do spring football. So if you're a quarterback going to a new school, it obviously is doesn't behoove you to just totally skip out on spring, skip out on all that spring install with the offense, any of that. So uh, at some point, surely uh, these two guys will have to be enrolled somewhere right. so, they can, so they can start going through uh, spring practice. Well, I'll just real quick speak for the fan base. The, this, this fan base, Sooner Nation, man, they are behind Dylan Gabriel. Jackson Dart comes, great. Opens up competition, makes everybody better. If he doesn't come, they're in good hands with Dylan Gabriel. That's the way everybody's approaching this thing. So I, I'm on board with that. The kid's a good football player. He's and he's got a, right. a really good uh, coach, creative play caller that's helping him out. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do. Absolutely. And hey, maybe maybe uh, maybe Jackson Dart and Caleb Williams are just going to go battle it out in the USFL. Maybe maybe that's where where this road leads. Maybe they just want to go play for a thousand bucks, whatever they're going to pay the players out there. Can't be much. I, I still maintain the longer this goes, the less I think Caleb Williams was a real person. That's the theory that I started with in jest, Seriously. and I th- I think I'm actually going to start rolling with that. It's great. It's I can't <laughs> believe it's January 26th, and we still don't have a decision from, especially from Caleb. I'll say Dart hopped in the portal a little later, but Caleb's been in the portal like a solid month now. The yeah. Animal Bowl was just eons ago, but we continue to press on. He's not come back to Oklahoma. We know that. It's just a matter of. USC or Wisconsin, I guess. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, we digress. We'll continue to keep an eye on that. Allsooners.com, of course, the place to be to make sure you know when Kayla makes a decision, when Dart makes a decision. We'll find out, hopefully, hopefully in due time. But we do want to stick with quarterbacks here on the recruiting trail. Oklahoma's been very busy. Well, they had a huge recruiting weekend with like a zillion visits. We'll talk about that in just a second. But let's first start with the big commit they picked up. Jackson Arnold, not Arnold Jackson, who Jackson Arnold, quarterback, four star, number seven quarterback in his class in 247 Sports' composite rankings. So obviously, puts a bunch of the rankings together, kind of spits out a, a composite. And number seven, Jackson Arnold comes to town, Denton, Texas, local guy, kind of, obviously, just down the road, not that far. You know, 2023 looks to be, you know, a, a, a uh, you know, a high upside prospect, at least, you know, from from the little bit I've seen of him feels kind of similar, not in the way they play, but just in the kind of the idea of as Nick Evers, really, which is upside, a lot of upside. Is he as much of a can't miss as some of the guys Oklahoma's had? Obviously not, but certainly looks like a guy who could be a starting quarterback at the major college football level soon. Brian, we can go to you first as kind of the re- recruiting guy here. Jackson Arnold, uh, what kind of an addition is this for Oklahoma? Yeah, it's really big. First off, he's the number one quarterback in Texas, and he's a guy that a lot of people are saying he only started his junior year this last year. So he's a guy that a lot of people are saying, hey, give him another year and he may very well shoot up these rankings even more. So uh, the Sooners got in on a guy at the ground floor. When you just watch his film, 
first off, Denton Geyer runs an offense that looks pretty recognizable to Oklahoma fans. Like if, if you put that offense on, you say, oh, I immediately see how this translates because it looks like the offense that Levy is going to install. So that's the first thing is he's very familiar with the kind of offense he wants to run. Then you just start watching him. He, he's labeled a, a pro style quarterback, but he has the intangibles with his feet to get out of the pocket and extend plays. When he does run those RPOs, he has enough big playability that you have to respect him as the ball carrier. And he can make all the throws in the book. He can throw accurately downfield vertically. He can just throw accurately over the middle, all that stuff. So it's everything you look for in a quarterback. And he's done it at the highest level in Texas high school football, right? He he took Denton Geyer to the state championship game this last year in his first year as a starter. So obviously as that winning pedigree, I don't think it could be seen as anything but a home run. I'm sorry that it's not Malachi Nelson or Arch Manning, but if you're not going to get one of those two guys, if Brent Venables isn't going to be out watching Arch Manning play basketball, this is as good a prospect in the country. Yeah, who that, Ryan kind of touched on it. That was where I was going to ask you specifically because um, you've been kind of trying to queue up with it a little bit. This essentially takes them out of the Arch Manning running, which, I mean, not that they were ever seriously in that, but, you know, they did make the offer. What do you make of that as far as, you know, obviously – it was kind of a pipe dream to get him, but that seems to kind of go away now uh, with with bringing Jackson Arnold in. Yeah, it's it was a pipe dream, but you can't completely disconnect uh, Jeff Lebby and the Manning family and the comments that Archie Manning made about him. Uh, we've talked sure. about this in the past that they have a lot of respect for him as a coach, and oh, you got a good one, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they have, they they like him a lot. So again, probably a pipe dream. I think we all agree. Uh, but that didn't mean Jeff Levy and those guys were going to say, okay, it's over. Um, but it, no, Jackson Arnold, not Arnold Jackson. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Jackson Arnold is a, uh, he's going to throw it to the gooch. That up. He's going to throw it to the gooch. If you guys, you older folks out there know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, uh, He's a guy that uh, is, is going to be a, he's a four-star recruit. Everybody says he's a four-star, but uh, he's a guy that, like like Ryan said, thirty what was it thirty nine hundred yards and thirty four touchdowns as a junior, only five interceptions, completed like sixty seven percent of his pass. The kid knows what he's doing. Watch his highlights, and you'll see somebody who's very dynamic, very confident, and that's what you want to run that offense. As someone who's not only can get out of the pocket and make things happen, but someone who knows where to go with the football and throws it with confidence, and then he throws it with accuracy and velocity. He's got all the tools. But just being a, a junior his first year as the, as the full-time starter, he looked the part. So, you know, go go, go to our website, allsooners.com. We've got the highlights posted there with the story mm-hmm. as well. So check him out. He's, he's an impressive kid. Yeah, he can definitely throw some bombs. He can run a little bit. He's, he's an athletic guy, you know, he's, even though he's, you know, more of a prototypical pocket guy. He can move, you know. So Jackson Arnold, potentially the next quarterback for Oklahoma, maybe after Nick Evers, maybe he beats out. Who knows? It's impossible to predict that stuff down the road. But here's the thing, though. Guy. Lincoln, you skipped 20. He had 2019 covered with Spencer Rattler, and then he skipped 2020. You know, Chandler Morris comes in. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you could sign here. It's cool. We got a spot for you. Never had a chance of playing. Then he, he gets uh, 2021 with Caleb Williams, and he doesn't even consider 2022. doesn't even look at the quarterbacks in the 22 class. Right. Well, now Oklahoma's doing things a little differently. They've got a 22 quarterback signed. They've got a 23 quarterback committed. So uh, that's got to be encouraging that you're back to the Bob Stoops model, which was signing a really good quarterback every year, not necessarily the number one guy in the country every other year. Right, right. So we'll see how that Shakes out uh, in due time. He's still got another year of high school football, obviously. So we'll be keeping up with uh, him next year. And maybe we'll get lucky in the schedules will align and and uh, one of you guys can see him next year. Obviously, he's in Denton. So, um, you know, we'll see how that shakes out next season. All right. So before we wrap up the segment, I, I touched on it a little bit. Uh, Ryan, I want to go to you. Huge recruiting weekend. Uh, it seemed like they had about a jillion visitors. Um, lots of guys visiting. Lots of high-profile players visiting. Gentry Williams, uh, I don't know, did he just visit as well? He basically reaffirmed his commitment. I think yeah, he was he, one of the guys who came and visited. He The weird rule, right, so Gentry Williams has already taken an official visit with Oklahoma, but when a new coaching staff comes in, you're able to reset and take that visit again. So Oklahoma was actually able to host him on a second official visit. Mm. Um, uh, okay. Rarely used rule, something that Oklahoma obviously hasn't had to worry about for 20-plus years. 
Right. So it's a big recruiting weekend for Oklahoma. They bring all these guys in. I mean, you can kind of set the scene however you want. I mean, there's a, a few guys who you think Oklahoma's in a good shape for. Uh, so like I said, there's a lot of guys. You don't need to go through them all. But just a few to keep an eye on here, maybe in the, in the next, you know, few days or this week or whatever. What, what day is this? It's Wednesday. Maybe by the end of, you know, early part of next week, uh, guys that maybe Oklahoma fans should, should keep an eye on. Yeah, let's start with two Florida defensive linemen, um, R. Mason Thomas. He's currently an Iowa State commit. And then Ahmad Moten, who was uh, Ahmad Moten, the, the defensive interior defensive lineman. He was Brent Venable's first offer um, at Oklahoma. So those are the two guys that come in, feel pretty good about them. Obviously, R. Mason Thomas is currently committed to Iowa State. Both those guys are taking a visit to Miami this weekend. So one of those things that get on beyond the Miami visit and let's see how things shake out. But those are two guys that OU's in a great spot with right now, currently as it stands, R. Mason Thomas, more of an edge rusher type guy. So so those are the two defensive linemen from Florida that Oklahoma brought in. Then you've got Jabarion Burt. He's the defensive back from Texas. I think it's Osceola, Texas. Um, I think that's right. Uh, it, don't ask me on pronunciations. That That's that's obviously uh, <laughs> the boss man who he's going to get out the pronunciation guide on the state map. But yeah, defensive back from Texas. That one feels uh, about as good as you can for Oklahoma to continue to add to that back end who will join Gentry Williams, like you said, who um, appeared to reaffirm his commitment with the Sooners. So so there you go. That'll round out what should be a very talented defensive back group here in 2022 then you've got Grayson Halton we're going to go to the west coast now he's from San Diego Um, he's another defensive lineman edge rusher type guy he's another guy that the Sooners brought in that probably feel really good about will end up in crimson and cream Oklahoma Oregon those are the two that are involved there so you're just looking at a lot of defensive talent brought in this weekend those are really the big names to know as far as who we're watching who we're on commit alert uh, for the 2022 class specifically. Sure. And uh, some people were kind of a little confused, and I don't blame anybody, it was confusing, which was Gentry Williams. He never decommitted. He just didn't sign, you know, in, in December. I basically kind of let the dust settle, and he announced the other day, essentially, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still staying. So it's not really a recommitment because he never decommitted in the first place, but just kind of letting everybody know I'm, I am staying with Oklahoma, his Oklahoma commit, and he'll sign. In, uh, in February. Who have any takeaways there from, from all the guys visiting? Obviously, I love Anthony Hill. That's what I mean. It's it's just a visit, but I mean, an absolute can't miss prospect. If you're unfamiliar with him, five star linebacker, number one rated linebacker in the 23 class, just a behemoth. Uh, he's awesome. He is crazy fun. And uh, he, I mean, I was Oklahoma's battling everybody for him. I mean, literally the entire country essentially has offered for him. So it's a long shot, but uh, he visited. So he got to talk to Brent Venables a little bit. That always catches my eye when somebody that good is in town, but anything that, you know, you took away from, from the weekend. Um, the, uh, the emphasis is obviously on defense. And when you get a guy like Todd Bates on your staff, mm-hmm. uh, that, that changes maybe the narrative of whether you can get those five-star linebackers and five-star edge rushers and five-star defensive tackles. Uh, he's had a history of doing that. So, uh, and not just him, there's other guys on the staff, Jay Valai, the cornerback coach, uh, sure. looks like he's got a, a pretty good history of, uh, of at least going after big name guys. Now he's been at Texas and, and, uh, Alabama the last couple of years. So he's got those brands behind him, but he's, he's got the OU brand with him now. And, uh, you know, listen, Brent Venable's going after defensive guys. Seems like a no brainer, right? That's what he should do. It's not that easy to change the culture and to start throwing out more offers defensively than what you've been used to over the past five years or, or even longer Right uh, under Lincoln Riley. The, the, the offense, quarterbacks, receivers, look at all the five-star receivers that Oklahoma's gotten over the last few years. The recruits and, and high school coaches and those seven-on-seven guys you know, who run those things, They've been pushing those guys to Oklahoma and they've been, you know, reaping the rewards of saying, Hey, my guy signed with Oklahoma. Now it's like, no, we want defensive tackles. We want edge rushers. We want linebackers. So the narrative, the culture may be changing a little bit, uh, a little bit faster than what we thought it would at Oklahoma. Absolutely. So certainly going to be interesting to keep an eye on it. And of course, all sooners.com place you want to be, keep sure up with it. We'll have uh, whenever guys commit, we'll have it ready for you. Highlight packages of all the guys like who said, so you can kind of get at least a little, 
couple minutes of uh, kind of an idea of what, what kind of a player they are. So that's all for you right there on allsooners.com. All right, we're going to take a time out here. Oklahoma made another transfer addition last night in conference. Lincoln Riley rolls over in his in his grave. He's not dead, but you get the idea. <laughs> in, in conference transfer. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about Oklahoma players in the NFL. It's been a busy weekend in the NFL playoffs for them. So lots of other stuff to get to coming up next on the SI Sooners podcast. Hey, listen up. Winter's here, okay? But you know the season's in Oklahoma. Cold one day, hot the next. That's a lot of work for your heating and air unit. But the guys at Trade Pros, they got you covered. Sign up for one of their no-hassle service plans. You can go pro, become elite, or the best deal is the MVC, most valuable customer. They'll come out twice a year and tune up your AC and your furnace. You get priority scheduling, and you get additional discounts. Just call Chris at Trade Pros, 405-316-0598. That's 405-316-0598. Or go to tradeprosokc.com. On Twitter, you can follow SI Sooners at all underscore Sooners. Ryan is at Radio's Ryan, who's at John E. Hoover. I'm at Josh M. Calloway. Our website is allsooners.com. We are a Fan Nation affiliate, part of the Sports Illustrated Network. Okay, segment two, we'll keep up with uh, the football team, of course. Staying active in the transfer report. We've talked about that a lot. Over the last month or so, they've just, I mean, they continue to add and add and add. They added again last night. While most have been defensive pickups, this was an offensive addition. Tyler Guyton from TCU comes to town. Obviously, a uh, in conference move here coming from the Horn Frogs. Played eight games last year in kind of a reserve role. Who have you wrote the story on them on allsooners.com? I'll let you kind of steer things here. Guyton, what what is what is Oklahoma getting? Do you think he comes right into the fold? You know, like pretty quickly? Is he kind of more of a future addition? Just kind of a lay lay the scene here with with Tyler Guyton. Yeah, can you believe Oklahoma signed a uh, recruit from inside a transfer from inside the Big Twelve Conference? I thought that was against the rules at OU. Right. Uh, oh no, that's right. That was under the previous coach that didn't do that. Yeah, that's right. I forgot Lincoln Riley. No. Uh, tongue in cheek. Which, which he's doing it at Pac-12. He's doing it. Which in he's the doing it in the Pac-12 too. <laughs> T- Tyler, uh, what's his name? The Travis Dye. Yeah. Travis, Travis Dye. Travis Dye. Yeah. No, Tyler is uh, Tyler Guyton. Six foot seven guys. Six foot seven. Three hundred and twelve pounds. He's a little lean at at six foot seven. At three twelve, you think, okay, he's massive. No, he's he's tall and he's long and he's actually a little bit lean. Uh, he was a three star prospect coming out of Manor Texas High School down in Austin. Uh, you know, he didn't have the greatest recruiting profile. I think number 112 in Texas, the 72nd best offensive tackle in the nation. We're using 24-7 sports there. But he goes to TCU. He red shirts. He plays in one game in 2020. Then in 2021, he he gets a little action at H-back. What? 6'7", 312, and he's an H-back. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, he played in eight games last year. I'm thinking that's a lot of jumbo. I haven't gone back and looked at the film, but I'm thinking that's a lot of jumbo packages. A uh, lot of goal line type stuff. And on one of those in the season finale against Iowa State, he slips out of the backfield, out of the uh, the kind of the edge of the line there and catches a six-yard touchdown pass. So kid's got hands. He's got some versatility. Uh, he played defensive line in high school. He's playing offensive line at TCU. So my guess is that he comes in and immediately competes for the starting job on the right side of the offensive line. It looks like Anton Harrison – is just what they wanted on the left side. But at right tackle, you know, they're losing Tyrese Robinson. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you're going to do is put him in there, say, go compete. And, uh, you know, maybe he wins that job. Maybe he beats out Wanya Morris. And how many years eligibility does Eric Swenson have? Has he got like, is he on his 13th year now? So, no, he's gone. I'm kidding. He's gone. I know he's gone. Yeah, I was like, is he back? No, he's he's not. He's got another five years. It's a life Lifetime contract. Are you signed to a lifetime contract? It's you a are. lifetime contract. I literally thought after the Jalen Hurts season that Swenson was gone. Like I was like, that Swenson's <laughs> gone, right? No, he's back, and he played another uh, year. Four years. So yeah. no, I'm, I'm kidding. He's not going to play, obviously, uh, Swenson. But uh, we'll, he'll be the Perry Ellis for Oklahoma football fans moving forward. How about that? We'll, we'll bring his name up. They've got. Uh, here's the deal. Now he played some uh, guard in uh, in high school. Guyton did. Well, Oklahoma also needs to replace a guard. Marquise Hayes is going to the NFL like Tyrese Robinson is. So he's got some versatility. Maybe he could come back and – or maybe he could come in there and, and compete for one of the starting jobs because there's two there's two jobs open right now. 
And we don't know what their plan is. Conjol's got another year, right? He's got the super senior year if he wants it. I believe so. So yeah. Andrew Rehm is the center. Uh, Robert Conjol has got a lot of experience playing guard, and now he's played a year of college football at Oklahoma. Maybe he's one of the guards. Uh, maybe Chris Murray moves to the other side. You never know. You also, you also have the Cal transfer, McCade Matower. I don't yeah, know where he McCade fits into McCade Matower, the... who's, yeah. who's got a lot of lot of experience at guard as well. So, that yeah, this is uh, Bill Biedenboe. He lost two guys to the NFL, and he went out and he got two guys in the transfer portal. And both of the guys that he got have big-time Division One experience. Yeah, Ryan, I mean, personally, projecting the offensive line, I don't want to do that <laughs> right now. I mean, feel free <laughs> as far as – I mean, I don't know – there's so many guys who could – I mean, you start getting a save on Bird. It's like the, the list goes on as far as, like, guys who you could see starting. It's like double-digit guys. But where do you think uh, of the move to bring in Guyton? Uh, I mean, just any thoughts, I guess, on, on that addition? Yeah, just from the recruiting side of things, right, Oklahoma only has two offensive linemen signed right now in the 2022 class. They're both tackles. So – um, the Sooners needed numbers. As Hoove mentioned, you lose two guys to the NFL, you pick two up in the portal. That helps there. Uh, you just need those numbers to compete and have the kind of depth you want in that offensive line room. And it's important to get a guy that has more than just one year of eligibility just because uh, they went big fish, uh, big you know game hunting here. Uh, recruiting wise in the offensive line room, and it doesn't look like they're going to pan out with a bunch of those guys. So you're going to roll with Sexton and uh, Jake Taylor. So you need that for numbers wise. Then just when you talk about on the field, we've said it. If you go back to our report card series, uh, the offensive line was a big disappointment last year. It's been a big disappointment two years running. Yeah. So the way I kind of look at that room is anyone that wants to come in and compete. Awesome. Cause Bill Beanbow, if he's not just wiping everything from last year and saying, look guys, uh, a lot of you did some good things. Not a single one of you guys did great things together. So he's going to go back to his old adage of he's going to look for his best five. So anyone that you can bring in to compete that can try to raise that competition level, raise that ceiling, uh, never a bad thing with how that unit has fared the last two years. Absolutely. Josh, uh, real quick, it's interesting that two of the guys that they picked up in the transfer portal, uh, Jeffrey Johnson from Tulane, came to Oklahoma last year, started that game against the Sooners, looked around and said, this place is nice. I'd like to play here. <laughs> then Tyler Guyton comes and makes his first career start for TCU at Oklahoma, looks around and says, holy crap, this place is sweet. I want to play here. That's interesting to me that you're recruiting them from the other sideline, basically. I'm not saying that's, you know, they're not, nobody's right. breaking rules or anything like that. But Oklahoma has a brand and a product to sell. And when other players from other teams come into the stadium, I think you can really put your best foot forward. Yeah, you want to win the game, but you put your best foot forward and, and treat them. You know, the, the visiting team comes in and you treat them well. Remember the old stories about uh, pink locker rooms? The visiting locker room was always 115 degrees, no air conditioning. You know, you treat those guys well when they come in to visit your stadium. Yeah. Guess what? You, they might want to play for you someday down the road. This is a it's an inter interesting development with the transfer portal for sure. Yeah, no, it, it's an underrated kind of in in that you have a, almost a little bit of an advantage when guys have played. They've basically done a recruiting visit <laughs> in a sense. They they experienced a game day at, at your stadium, uh, which is kind of an interesting little you know kind of an advantage that you know a guy. I don't know what other schools he was considering for Tyler Guyton, but he's like, well, I've played in Oklahoma, at Norman. You know, I, I know what that's like. I don't know what it's like at place X. You know what I mean? And so that, that is kind of a little bit of an advantage you get when you're recruiting guys who, especially when they came to you last season or in the past. So that is kind of an interesting little note there. Um, Oklahoma continues to make additions on the staff. It, it's crazy. I don't, I mean, it's like they have a hundred people on the, on the staff now. We'll first start with James Dobson. He comes over. As an assistant strength coach, he's going to work with Schmitty. I don't know if that means that Schmitty works him. Like, is is that is doing the workouts for Schmitty just as hard as being his assistant? I don't know. It may be. We'll find out in due time. But James Dobson comes over. He was the head strength and conditioning coach at Nebraska with Bo Pelini. So there's a little bit of an OU connection there. And then also um, at Vanderbilt under Derek Mason, who actually just went to become the new DC at, o at Oklahoma State uh, just the last – 24, 48 hours that became official. So, um, I mean, Oklahoma continues to take their strength and conditioning very seriously. We talked about this last week where Ryan was saying, you know, 
having the personal chef and like all that stuff and the Schmitty, and they're bringing in another coach to help James Dobson. I don't know exactly what kind of role he'll play, but obviously he was a, uh, he was the head guy at a couple of major programs, obviously, including Nebraska. So you bring him in as an assistant, seems like it can only help you. I mean, it, I don't know how this can anything be anything but a positive thoughts on Oklahoma adding another strength coach here to go along with Schmitty in, uh, in James Dobson. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the big thing. Like you're <laughs> saying, when uh, when you when you were taking guys <laughs> that that held uh, those roles at other spots, and they're cool to sign up to be an assistant, like that's only going to beef that up. It's what you need at Oklahoma. And the other side of it too is, I'm just happy that uh, we've made a lot of fun of the three co-defensive coordinators in Norman. But if you look at Billy Napier's staff at Florida, at least there's not a game changer coordinator and a. Uh, Unreal. Like just and just making up names of the the director of scouting and self scout and all that stuff. No, so uh, it, look for for as much um, chagrin as there was from former players, from the fan base, all that about the CrossFit Jesus uh, method that Oklahoma had under Benny Wiley and all that stuff. This is what a SEC strength program looks like: building out, having a guy like Schmidt, and then adding very experienced assistants and all that stuff. Um, I think that it's look Joe on said it. Joe Harris said it. They recognize the challenge. They understand what it's going to take to make that transition. When you look at last year's media guide versus what's going to be put out this year, it's going to look a lot more like an sec team than a big 12 team. Who, I don't know. Did you guys see the, um, the tweet from Andrea Rame, Andrew Rame's mom. Did you guys see yes. that? He messaging with, with Andrew, um, on Snapchat, which is funny, I can't imagine like contacting my parents on Snapchat. But they, um, <laughs> she she asked him, "How are the workouts? Can you tell the difference between Schmidt and Wiley?" And he said, "Um, what? This is a complete 180." Yes, our first day in the weight room yesterday was nothing like we've ever done before. So yeah, things are different. Things are changing. Who? What do you think about Dobson coming over and Oklahoma continuing to just take strength and conditioning very seriously, trying to whip this team into a completely different? <laughs> shape than it was you know last year i my my guess is lincoln riley wanted more strength coaches and more recruiting assistants and more uh assistant position coaches and got told you're not winning you know you're not winning enough maybe i don't i don't know i would like to have heard the conversation um, sure over the years over the last few years but i get the strong sense that lincoln riley wanted all these extra resources well Fast forward to the, the the you know meeting on the jetway in uh, in South Carolina somewhere South Carolina right and uh, Joe Castiglione is having all these conversations with Brent Venables. I think Brent Venables wanted the Oklahoma job. He made it clear from you know his first conversation with his wife. Hey, did you see the OU jobs open? What? No, it's not. Yes, it is. You need to apply. Uh, I don't think there's any question Brent Venables wanted the OU job, but I think Brent also had some not conditions, but maybe some situations that he wanted to see some commitments from the athletic department and the administration that he wanted to see made. And that is more resources for recruiting, more resources for strength and conditioning, more resources for nutrition, more resources, you know, a chef and a a griller and a designated smoker or whatever's going on there. It's very interesting the way this staff has grown under Brent Venables, because I I think Lincoln Riley wanted all this stuff. And Lincoln Riley had some, by some measure, got told, nah, you know, we'll, we'll get there. Patience, right. patience. And then he left for USC because one of the reasons was he wasn't getting what he wanted. Well, now Brent Venables is getting what he wants probably. And then some, so it's been an impressive, uh, you know, turn to watch this staff, watch Brent Venables staff grow. You said it, Ryan, when the media guide comes out next year, there's probably going to be instead of one page for all your uh, support staff, there might be three or four pages for the support staff this year. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll keep that train rolling. Another addition, and who, again, take a bow. It's a special teams uh, ad. Jay Nunez from Eastern Michigan comes over. Um, It's an off-the-field position, so he's not special teams coordinator. At least I don't think that's going to be his title. Maybe it will be. I don't know. But he comes over to assist with special teams. Um, Like I said, been with Eastern Michigan. He's an Oklahoma guy. Again, they've done a lot of this. People from the state. He's from Alva, Oklahoma, which I had to look on the map where it is. It's like very north. It's like almost <laughs> way out there. Yeah, it's way, way up there. there. Um, 
played at Pittsburgh State. A really smart guy. He won, or he was a semifinal, excuse me, for the William V. Campbell, which I talked about before, was the academic Heisman. He was a player. Um, he went to Minnesota, was a quality control assistant there for special teams. He's been with Eastern Michigan as their special teams coordinator. He comes to help. Drop my phone. He comes to help with special teams. Um, who, again, take a bow. I mean, Oklahoma clearly is addressing. You talk about Brandon Hall, his special teams background. You bring Jay Nunez. He has special teams background. It seems like OU is putting an emphasis on trying to whip that position group into shape where OU stunk last year. We did the report card. Yeah. We ripped them. They were terrible at special teams last year outside of Turk. That was about it. And so um, they're continuing to try and make improvements there. Turk and Burke carried that special teams unit, made them look real good. Uh, Burkich faded down the stretch. But, yeah, no, they needed some coaching, you could tell, those players. Uh, and, and not just that, but Lincoln – under Lincoln, the, the return teams have become very, very, very safe and very not dynamic. And yeah. you know, for all the analytics that go into special teams, field position, average starting field position, you want your scoring drives to be only this many yards instead of that many yards. You, you score so many more times when you only have to go 45 yards than you do when you have to go 55. It's, it's a real stat. Look it up. Mm. And for all the stuff that goes into that, Lincoln was always like, no, no, we just want the football. Doesn't matter where doesn't matter where it is on the football field. Football field position doesn't matter. We're going to go score. And when they didn't, it blew up in their face. And you know, you had they had opportunity after opportunity to change the field position or to you saw it in the in the bowl game when Bob Stoops yep. said, Marvin Mims, go return this punt. Do not fair catch. Go return it. And what did he do? He had the 28-yard punt return. It was the longest of the year. I think it was the longest of the last two years. So let your players go make plays. Let your players be football players. Don't let them, you know, make them be back there just, you know, for your playbook and your play sheet. Uh, that, that's something that I think really kind of neutered the OU special teams. OU recruits some of the best athletes in the country, and those guys have not been allowed to show it on special teams, and it's too bad. Not, not that they haven't ever done it, but I'm just saying over the last couple of years, it's really gotten bad. And so having guys back there whose job it is, it is, Jay Nunez or Brandon Hall or whoever, to come up with return um, t- uh, tweaks, you know, uh, little, right. little tweaks in the return game. We're going to block it this way this time. Coach, the first three games we've blocked up this return this way. Well, this time we're going to switch it up because they they overload on this side or they crisscross or they do something in their, in their gunners. Uh, we're going to switch it up. That stuff wasn't happening at Oklahoma in the past couple of years. So maybe Oklahoma all of a sudden becomes a, a dynamic return team again. Uh, maybe they go out and block punts. You know, mm-hmm. they have, when's the last time they blocked a punt to change a game? I've, we've seen a couple of blocked extra points and field goals and stuff like that. And those, those have certainly helped change change football games. But in terms of chasing down a, a punter, you know, uh, a Guaybu right. against Texas a couple of years ago, last year, 2020 was one. Um, when those things happen, they change the game. And when they don't, the game becomes very, um, I don't know, there's a, there's a certain parity exists that that does, you know, when, when teams are, when teams are even, when they're dead even on special teams, there's a parity that comes into play. And that's why Oklahoma has been struggling in those areas, I think. Real quick, Ryan, before we get your thoughts on Nunez, Brent Venables tweeted a video just now, and they're, they're in the car driving in Florida. It looks like that's Miguel Chavis driving and Todd Bates is in the passenger seat. Venables is in the back seat. What's that about? Get the HBC up in the front. That's crazy to me. Who would never sit in the back seat? He would never allow that in our operation, unless he's doing his radio show, which has happened. I was going to say, I did two hours of radio in the back seat. I'm going back from San Antonio. Well, we've that's got... crazy to me. We, we don't really have that problem because either Josh or I are just volunteering to be like, yeah, we'll just go fall asleep back there in the backseat. So that solves that. I'm fine with the backseat. I sprawl out on the way to San Antonio. I legit was laying down. It was great. It was fantastic. Well, hey, maybe Venables is like, hey, I'm I'm run. I'm man in the phones. I'm running the recruiting operation back here. Let, let me do that. And you guys just go up there. Right. And do your thing. Do your thing. Right. Ryan, if, if any thought, anything you wanted to add on uh, on Jay Nunez coming over? I mean, just it seems like another nice addition that can only help. I mean, it can only be a positive. Yeah, not to beat a dead horse, but it was just puzzling for me all of last year how Lincoln Riley spent years with Shane Beamer on staff. You had 
um, twofold. One, Oklahoma really didn't have a ton of holes as far as kick coverage and punt coverage when Shane Beamer was there. And two, you had a guy like Trey Brown for all of the consternation we have about the punt game. When Trey Brown was returning kickoffs, OU was in the top 35, I believe, nationally in a kick return yard, average kick return yard. So they were starting ahead of the 25-yard line, which, like you said, any closer you can be, awesome. Then all of a sudden, just in one year, I don't know how – You have a head coach who claims to be as smart as Lincoln Riley is who can see that value and then it just goes away. Bedlam, you have a kickoff return for a touchdown that was a backbreaker. Texas, you have a punt get blocked early, backbreaker. So outside of just the individual greatness of Michael Turk and Gabe Burkich, it was a disaster. So yeah, bring in all the special teams guys you can because Oklahoma is not at the level of Alabama or Georgia, but they are graded on that curve of, are you competing to win a national championship? Well, guess what? If you can return a kick, if you can steal seven points, that goes a long way in those kinds of games. And if you can do that all year long, when we talk about it, like in the big 12, the margin of error for teams playing Oklahoma is minuscule. If the Sooners can steal a kickoff return, nothing kills an upset bid quicker than stuff like that. So There's no reason not to pay huge attention to that side of the ball. I get it. It's not sexy, all that stuff. When it pays off, it's game changing. Here you go, guys. I am way oversimplifying this, jumping way out on a limb, sticking my neck way out. But that video that you just referenced of Brent Venables, I watched it. Uh, They're in Tampa. There, he drove by uh, Hillsboro Community College. They showed he showed a close up of the, of the street sign coming down the through the window. Uh, not being the recruiting expert that I wish I was, I looked up uh, recruits coming out of Hillsboro Community College. There is a recruit, a wide receiver by the name of Arian Knighton, uh, six foot, one hundred sixty pounds, junior college transfer. He is he is uh, cool on Florida. Illinois, Iowa State, Tennessee, and Toledo, according to his 24-7 sports profile. So, Arian, E-R-R-I-Y-O-N. You're really taking a shot here. Yeah. If you nail that, then yeah. Trying to connect some dots, man. If this kid uh, is suddenly a a priority recruit for the Sooners. Right. You heard it here first. If not, don't worry. Hashtag reporting. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you went a way different direction than me. When I look at that video, I'm just like, Brent Venables is clearly the smallest man in that car, and it makes sense to put him in the back seat. That, that was that my is true. Away. That is very true, is that Miguel Chavis and Todd Bates, not small dudes. Too so big dudes. maybe they were just like, Brent, please, don't <laughs> leg do that rooms. to us. Come on. <laughs> leg you already oh, make God. way more money than us. Can we just get the leg <laughs> Let us have this. All right, before we get out of here and get into some other sports in the final segment, I do want to talk about real quick, something kind of cool that developed over the weekend was that all the NFL teams that don't have an OU guy were eliminated. So with going into Championship Sunday, an Oklahoma player will win the Super Bowl. Actually, all the teams, I think, have two, at least two. The Chiefs, the Chiefs, Bills, and Rams do. Who are the other team? The Niners? Yeah, they have two if you count Sermon. So there you go. So it's going to be multiple Sooners are going to win a Super Bowl this year, no matter what happens. Kind of a cool little recruiting thing. Who you can you can run points since your Rams are still in it. Have the big win over the Bucks. Bobby Evans and Obo Okoronkwo on yeah. the Rams trying to get trying to get a ring. Yeah, I was yelling at Obo last week when he hit Tom Brady, but didn't get the ball out. He hit his arm while he was throwing, but the ball continued yeah. on, fluttered up into the air, and none of the none of the uh, Ram cornerbacks caught it. I'm like, come on! The ball was a it was an arm punt. <laughs> I get a little stressed out during the Rams playoff games, guys. I don't know if you yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah, a, uh, running joke on my radio show. So you have you have Obo and Bobby Evans on the Rams. The Chiefs, you have a medley. You have Orlando Brown, Creed Humphrey, James Winchester. And Blake, Blake Bell. Bell. And then with the Bills, you have Daryl Williams, who starts, and Cody Ford, who plays kind of sparingly, kind of like Bobby Evans, kind of comes and goes. And then what team am I leaving? Am I forgetting? 49ers. Well, the Bills Trent are Williams. out. Oh, 49ers. You're they have Trent Williams, the obviously, and then Trey Sermon. <clears throat> yeah, the, the Bills Good are man. out. The Bengals are in. So you got Joe Mixon, Smaj P. Ryan. Are out. Oh, what am I doing? Yeah, it's not yeah, the Bills. I'm, I'm, Bills. I'm totally right. blowing this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm totally blowing this. Bengals, and it's Joe Mixon, P. Ryan, and Jordan Evans. But Jordan Evans is on the IR, but he is he would still get a ring. But you have Mixon and P. Ryan. You're right. Why am I that game on Sunday was just too unbelievable. That I thought they both won. Yes. <laughs> it's like can they, they both play the win. Super Bowl? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, right. So an OU player, multiple, 
will get a Super Bowl ring this year. Cool little recruiting thing. Of course, keep up with the uh, Sooners and NFL. We have it every week for you, which now there's just a couple games left. But still, we can let you know how everybody did and see who can uh, win a championship. No matter what happens, OU will be adding a Super Bowl ring um, to their collection of former players. OU was fourth this year with 19 players in the playoffs, 19 former players in the playoffs. Somebody told me Alabama had 33. I looked it up. They only had like 24. So between 24 and, and right. 19 uh, was the was the top spot with 24 Alabama, and then OU was fourth with 19. So pretty impressive run there by the former Oklahoma Sooner players. Yeah, and, and somebody else yeah. messaged me on Twitter and said, are you just giving the players credit for this, or do the, does Lincoln Riley and the coaching staff get credit too? Come on. A, a lot <laughs> of them are not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Lincoln yeah, Riley coaching I mean, staff like, deserve plenty of I mean, credit for Trent Williams. Yes. Yeah. I mean. That too. James yeah. Winchester, right? No. Come on. No. Lincoln gets credit. Lincoln gets credit where credit is due. And a lot of that is offensive line play and uh, and quarterback play for sure. Yeah. Did you guys see um, in the divisional round, pro football focus, their two highest rated offensive linemen, Orlando Brown, Trent Williams. So if you're Bill Beanbow, you're like, yeah. yeah. That's what's up. So and Creed posted a higher grade by Pro Football Focus than any rookie offensive lineman in in their history, which is phenomenal. So yeah, OU right. offensive linemen are having having a good uh, good NFL big good year. time in the NFL. Yep, big year. So keep up with that. See which former Sooners get themselves a Super Bowl ring. And it was you know I do that Sooners in the NFL every single week of the entire season. And I you know I kind of was thinking you know once we got to the playoffs. You know, especially the wild card weekend, I was like, you know, this is going to really trim down. Not really. Most of the guys <laughs> were on playoff teams, a lot of them. Um, so give kind of credit in that regard. And also one other little piece of NFL Sooners news, Jalen Hurts confirmed by the uh, Eagles that he'll be back next year. Certainly seemed to earn it. I mean, he has his flaws. I think people can see that. But he was certainly good enough and took a team that's just not very good. It, to the playoffs last year. They don't have hardly any weapons on that offense at all. So you feel like if you can add something there, maybe they can make that work. So he'll at least get another year. Baker's yeah. back with the Browns another year. So everybody will be back in their respective spots, at least who for the thought, Who would have thought we'd be saying the Eagles want to build around Jalen Hurts? Crazy. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect that. And then uh, the the Baker thing, uh, I'm, I'm glad he uh, is uh, taking some time to get himself healthy. He had the surgery. He's going to be back next year better than, better than ever. Maybe you guys uh, followed up on this. I just saw it in the car waiting, waiting at a red light on my way home from the studio. He's jumping off social media. Did I see that correctly? Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah, just, just kind of getting off it. I think he's just he, you know, he's one of those guys right now, similar to Russell Westbrook or similar to, there's some other athletes that just, they can't really do anything right, you know, in the public eye. So I think he just, yeah, probably a good idea. Probably just, yeah. you know, maybe hop off it for a little while. Wish um, I could. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's part nice. of the gig. I'm not like, I, I love, I'm on Twitter all the time. So it's stupid for me to act like I don't like it. <laughs> Um, all right, we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll get into some other sports, both basketball teams. The men just can't seem to find it. Women got absolutely destroyed by Ioka Lee. We'll talk about that, and uh, we'll get into some other sports. Got some some big news on the softball front that Ryan's getting into. We'll talk about that next on the SI Sooners podcast. Hey, are you a business owner looking to get your product out there to the masses? Let's say you run a hotel in Norman or a car dealership in Oklahoma City or a restaurant in Edmond, or maybe you're a small online business who creates and sells OU merchandise, and you just want Sooner Nation to come sample your wares. Well, then consider advertising in this space right here on the SI Sooners podcast. SI Sooners reaches thousands of readers, viewers, and listeners literally every day. And the SI Sooners podcast is the ideal place to find your next customer. To advertise, send an email to allsoonerssi at gmail.com or DM us on Twitter at all underscore Sooners. Final segment of the SI Sooners podcast. We'll get into some other sports here. We'll start with men's basketball, who eh, they just keep losing. I, I don't really know what to say about it. I mean, they, they're playing okay. I mean, they're playing good teams. It's the Big 12. It's very unforgiving, but they lose um, again, since our last show, to Baylor on Saturday. They kind of put up a decent fight for a while. Baylor just too good, pulled away late. They play West Virginia tonight. We're recording this one thirteen on Wednesday right now. They play West Virginia Wednesday night in a game that you almost have to have in Morgantown. I mean, as of right now, 
And it's just Joe Lenardi. He's not the end all be all. There's a million brackets, and I haven't looked at all of them, obviously. But Joe Lenardi still has OU in the tournament as of now, as a 10 seed. So it's still out in front for the Sooners. They still have really good wins. They still have a chance to get good wins. The college basketball committee cares way more about your wins than your losses. At the end of the year, they pretty much look at who you beat. That's why OU teams have made the tournament in the past with a sub 500 Big 12 record. So. It's still all out there for this team, but it just you, you look at them, you look at their schedule. They play number one Auburn on Saturday. Good God. Jabari Smith is incredible. He's going to give them problems. And it just you wonder when it's going to get better because you look at the schedule going forward. You look, and I thought, surely it lightens up in February. Not really. It's still pretty much just as bad. They go to, they still have to go to Lubbock. They still have to go to Ames. Um, it doesn't get much better. They still got to go to Fog. Ryan and I are going to be there. We got confirmed the other day. We're really excited about that. We're going to be at Fog Allen here in a few weeks. Still have to go to Stillwater. I mean, there's, there's, it's not friendly the rest of the way. So I, I guess just where do you go from here if you're Porter Molds? You have to find a way to get some wins. Uh, yeah. Soon. So uh, you're right. It's not going to be easy by any stretch. And and they're on a four game losing streak. And and uh, you know if if you just Go back to their win against Iowa State. They put up 79 points. Their next four games, 52 against Texas, 58 against TCU, 64 against Kansas, and 51, 51 against Baylor. Not going to get it done. Uh, yeah, the, the offense is struggling. You saw 25 turnovers against Baylor. I had Ryan on the show yesterday, and I said, man, they turned it all over uh, eight of their first 10 possessions, which is literally on pace for 50 turnovers. And you laugh and you scoff and you say, nobody could have 50 turnovers. Dude, they had, they had 25. 20, they had <laughs> halfway to 50. That's unbelievable. But having said all that, having lodged my complaint with the uh, management there, right? L- listen to the schedule they've got coming up. Yes, Auburn number one in the country on Saturday. It's a non-conference game, obviously, for now. They're at West Virginia. West Virginia is a very winnable game. I don't think they're going to win, but it is a winnable game. They got TCU at home. That's a winnable game. They lost to them in Fort Worth, but it's a winnable game. They got Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State's in last place in the standings. That's a winnable game. All of a sudden, you look up and you've got three conference wins. That changes the entire thinking for this team, the entire confidence and narrative, whatever you want to say. And then you get back into the meat of it with Tech, Kansas, Iowa State, Texas, and all those guys. But uh, just on the whole, I think this is a stretch. This is a real opportunity for Oklahoma and Porter Moser. But Ryan feels like they have to find a way to win. If they, They're they not going to beat Auburn unless they just play out of their minds. Um, the, going in there, number one, that seems like not going to happen. So you're 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 staring down the barrel of a six-game losing streak. If you can't win tonight against West Virginia, this game feels huge. Yeah, you need this game because, yeah, they're not going to win against Auburn, but here's what they can do. Um, Auburn's not playing this kind of grind that Oklahoma is for OU. That's just another game where there's like, oh, geez, the second time we play the number one team this year on the road, darn. And, and OU can go in there and push them. And if they can do that, then if you beat West Virginia and then push Auburn and then like who have said, you can come home and you can beat a TCU, all of a sudden you're feeling good again. And you're like, oh yeah, we are a good basketball team. We just happen to be playing a murderer's row and all that stuff. But it all starts, who have you identified it? But I came on your radio show, what was it, yesterday, Monday, one of the two, and I was like, hey, do you know where Oklahoma ranks nationally in turnovers per game? Josh, I can ask you this. Do you know there are 350 teams in college basketball? Do you know where OU ranks? I don't. It's got to be top 10 or high. I mean, it, they turn over like half the possessions, it feels like. Yeah, they are uh, 320th out of 350. They are the bottom 30 in the country. I literally pulled it up and as a joke was like, it'll be faster if I just go to the last page and then scroll up from there. No, they were on the last page. I didn't have to scroll at all. They were just right (laughs) there in my face. So they have to figure out a way. And like Porter Moser after the Baylor game, like that's the most like you would have thought it was a guy coaching for his job as dejected as he was. And it was just turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. We talked to him yesterday and Eric Bailey's just asking him if he likes the Bears and what he thinks about the coaching search. And Porter goes on like a two minute diatribe about how, yeah. how Oklahoma can't stop turning the ball over and how he's watching that was Eric hilarious. videos and all that. Like Porter Moser's obsessive. He's obsessed with this. So it's one of those things that it'll be a good test because they, they just don't have the offensive firepower. They don't. So they can't turn the ball over like that when you don't have. 
a, a bailout score. It'll be fascinating to see how they they handle that the back end of this year because we're going to get a, a, a firsthand experience of what Porter can do with maybe a team that's not as talented as everybody else. But this is just going to be a testament to his coaching. If they can't get it done and they're turning the ball over 12 times a game, it is what it is. But you can't live with those 25 turnovers. Let me ask you guys a quick question. Uh, can turnovers in basketball be like, contagious like missed free throws or drop passes or something like that where everybody is all of a sudden turning the ball over because i looked it up in the last box score the baylor game seven guys had multiple turnovers seven had multiple turnovers Mm. so everybody's doing it yeah yeah seriously i i do i think so it's just got to care of the basketball it's just so many passes that are just forced it just it's or sloppy. It seems simple, but it's like the, the team is just not anywhere near good enough offensively to just give away that many possessions. Well, and it's, it's, it's that simple. It's mind numbing because when you look at it, they're still in the top 10 as far as Ken Palm field goal efficiency. So Porter, Porter Moser's told us this over and over that when they do get shots up, just pure shooting wise, they take good shots and they make a ton of them. So if you turn the ball over 20 times, you're taking 10 buckets off the board. That's literally how efficient Oklahoma's two point offense is right now. So you look at right. any one of these games that they've lost. And if you give them six turnovers back, convert it to three buckets, all of a sudden they're like three and two over the last five. And we're talking about massive wins and how this is a team that's overachieving. That's the frustrating part too, is that it's so clearly this is the result that's happening X and it's happening because of turnovers Y. And if you can fix that, we'd be talking about a whole different middle of the season, but you can't, they, they can't do it. They, they right. over and over and over uh, all across January. Right. And, you know, it, obviously if you, it, it could turn around, you know, they got that great Iowa state win. They got their, their asses handed to them by Texas and Baylor mostly, you know, kind of pulled away, but they easily could have won the TCU game right there with Kansas, right to the very end of that game. Christian Brown hits that crazy, you know, deep three where they contested it pretty well. He just hit the shot. You know I mean? They easily could have got a couple of wins. So it, it, you know, it could be a lot better with a couple of small things being different, but they got to find a way to turn around. And like you said, Ryan, that was absolutely hilarious. We're talking to Porter yesterday and, Eric Bailey asks him first question, who of you aren't on the zoom, but first question, just like a light in the mood kind of thing, you know, Paul, are you a bears fan? We've talked about the Cubs before are you a bears fan. And he said, yeah, I am a bears fan. He's like, and then he just launches into how OU needs to take care of the basketball. <laughs> and like, <laughs> the he, question he was, are you a Bears fan? Well, it was, are you a Bears fan? And who <laughs> do you want to be the next head coach? And he's like, I haven't been keeping up right. with that because two minutes of why we can't right. uh, turn the ball over. He was like, Eric Spolstra, he's an amazing coach. He started, it was like literally two minutes about nothing about the Bears. It was so funny. Um, he got to the end and was like, sorry, that had nothing to do with the Bears. But, you know, I was like, no, that's that's cool. Porter is, uh, he's, it, it, it's, if Oklahoma continues to struggle and they miss a tournament, it will not be from a lack of trying from Porter Most. That guy is borderline obsessed with getting that team to where it needs to be. So that's not going to be the issue. And, you know, moving forward. Yeah, I feel awful for our friend Bob Prisbillo from Sooners Group because all he wanted to do was talk some bears. That's all he wanted to do was get up there, right. uh, dream about Harbaugh. And Porter's like, no, I refuse. I, I do not. I do not recognize Bears football right now. With these <laughs> massive turnover. Right. Problems. Right. Right. So, yeah, we'll see if they can turn around West Virginia tonight and then they play. Uh, number one Auburn on Saturday. Good luck with that. They only have one more home game on a Saturday. The rest of the season, it's January. That's kind of insane wow. when you think like just the way they schedule. They go to Stillwater, they go to Fog Allen, they go to Auburn, they go. Uh, there's other one. Obviously, they will be at Iowa State. I think on a Saturday. At Iowa, it's like they they don't play at home on Saturdays anymore. <laughs> they have one more home game on a Saturday. It's Bedlam. Right at the end of February. So kind of crazy. Ryan and I will be in uh, fog, though. Very excited for that. And we plan to be in Stillwater. We'll hope that works out. We'll find out, uh, obviously, you, you assume, pretty pretty soon. Speaking of Stillwater, Bedlam, women's team, they play Oklahoma State tonight as well. Very rare men and women playing at the exact same time. Doesn't happen very often. They're both going to be playing tonight um, as the women try to bounce back also. Just hammered by Kansas State on Sunday. Holy Lord. They got up to 14 in the rankings. The vibes are good. 
They're winning games all over the place, and the vibes are still good. It's one game, but Ioka Lee dropped a 60-piece on them. Holy moly. How does that happen? Um, who have you wrote about it? So I'll let you go first. I What happened? What happened? She made like 25 yeah. out of 30 shots or something. I mean, 23 just, of 30 from the floor. Um, no basically answer. everything in the paint. She was zero for zero from three-point range. She's not a three-point shooter. She's a six-foot-six-inch <laughs> No banger. threes. Scored 60. She, yeah. No threes. Scored 60. Think about that. That's basketball in it's 1980. Like That's like basketball in 1980. You know? Yeah, That's pistol, not basketball in 20. Yeah. Pistol, pistol Pete would be proud. It's wilt. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she just was bigger and stronger than anybody Oklahoma had on her. Uh, Oklahoma, you know, Jenny Baranchik and those guys tried a couple of different defenses on her. And as Jenny said after the game, we did not have any answers, clearly. Uh, 61, that's an all-time record. No women's college basketball player has ever scored more than 61. Uh, that's that's the new mark. I mean, we saw you know Maddie Williams for OU put 40, I think, five in last year. And that was the second highest mark in Big 12 history behind Brittany Griner's 50 piece. Well, this is a 61. It was unbelievable. So you had a lot of history come out of that game. But on the other side, you're like, if you're Oklahoma, you're like, okay, is this? I think I told you guys. When you put the Oklahoma roster, you line them up on the baseline. And then you look at the other team and you line them up on the baseline. Most times you're going to look at the other team and go, I'll take them. Oklahoma's got a bunch of try hard, big hearted kids who, you know, they're scrappy and they play good basketball, but they're not like physically imposing in any way, shape or form. Nobody on that roster is. Meanwhile, other teams come in there. You saw West Virginia, everybody in the big 12 has got a long lean roster that just dominates, you know, physically appearance wise, they, they look like they're unbeatable. Oklahoma doesn't have that. Oklahoma doesn't have any players like that. So when, you know, something like this happens and you see a coach feed the post, feed the post, feed the post, keep getting two points every trip down the floor, she almost outscored the the Sooners by herself. Uh, or did she? Wait, what was the final score? 95-64? Yeah, she didn't end up outscoring them by herself. But there was a point where Close. Lee had 53 and Oklahoma had 51. And you're like, what is yeah. ha- what is happening right now? What? <laughs> So what do they do? What are they supposed to do? I think I think they're going to find where teams are going to try to stop outplaying them, and teams are going to do what Kansas State did, and that's out-athlete them uh, because Oklahoma doesn't right. have just a bunch of impressive, imposing athletes. They've got a bunch of kids who know how to play basketball and a coach who knows how to coach them up, and they've really bought into everything that she's taught them this year and coached them to, but, man, they hit the wall in Manhattan. Yeah, a little bit of a perfect storm, too. Obviously, no answers defensively for Lee down low. And then they were getting the looks that they normally get offensively. It, it just their shots were altered by Lee's presence, and they missed a lot of buckets basically at the rim. Uh, not necessarily layups, but uh, drives and attacking the bucket. Stuff that usually goes in for Oklahoma. And then we know the women's team, they just play such a high-octane pace they're going to have a little bit more turnovers they had an extra heaping of turnovers as you could see that i think they understood we've got no shot at defending her on this end we have to have everything they got sped up which is kind of remarkable considering how quickly they play uh perfect storm for sure it'll be interesting to see if they can just put that all behind them though with this bedlam game tonight it's a game they should win it's a game they should win handily but it's right. bedlam the, it, things get wonky in those games. We know that. I don't have to tell anyone that. It, I, I'm fascinated to see what their response is tonight in the LNC. Yeah, the rematch, February 26th. A, the Wildcats will come to Norman, Lloyd Noble Center, which I didn't realize um, is a very, very, very rare doubleheader that day because the men play at 11 in Bedlam right before that game. So Ryan, we may we we may make that a, a double feature uh, that day because Ioka Lee in Kansas State will be at Lloyd Noble Center right after the men play Bedlam. So I, something that I've always said should happen more in college basketball: double double features, men and women playing back to back. I've always I, I always have pushed for that to happen more often. I've always thought that'd be a great idea for fans and whatnot. So there you have it: Bedlam's at eleven, and then Kansas State comes right after at two. So that should be a, a big day at the Lloyd Noble Center. Looking forward to that uh, at the end of the month there. So we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. That happened already once this season where the women played right before the men. 
Um, I remember yeah, catching the it, tail it, end. It was like Jenny Bronchak's 100th win or whatever. Yeah, I think it actually happened twice because uh, the uh, not necessarily a double header, but both games were playing that Friday before uh, the Baylor football. Yeah, you're game, right. That was, was like that was a big difference. That was yeah, like ten. It was it was field trip day yeah. for the women's game, and then I got evicted from the Lloyd Noble Center because apparently Fort Knox preparing for UT Arlington or yeah. something that night. The walkthrough. I was like, guys, I'm just trying to finish this story and get on my way. Like I'm not right Whatever. so yeah so february 26th we'll have a double header which you don't get very often in big 12 play i should say it does happen but big 12 play seems to be a little more rare so we'll have that later this month all right other sports diamond sports are getting close um we're about to move into february which means it always sneaks up on you because you just you think spring sports you think in march april uh softball and baseball both start you know halfway early part of february for softball especially ryan you have some cool news i want to i want to go to you here we'll talk about softball in a second number one and everything like we thought but you have some cool stuff coming up as far as softball coverage nobody covers that softball team like you do like all sooners but especially obviously you specifically let us know what you have coming up for softball fans yeah pretty stoked um if you're an ou softball fan or if you're just a softball fan in general uh, 1077, the franchise this is the spot you're going to want to be during softball season, Wednesday nights from seven to eight, um, starting February, I believe 23rd. I think that's that Wednesday, Nicole Mendez and I will be rolling out an hour softball show every single week. We're hoping to link up with a player or coach interview from obviously Oklahoma, Nicole Mendez. I don't have to tell you her bona fides, but she's got connections all across the country. So that should be a ton of fun just as far as what's going on nationally, what's going on with OU, and some insight from someone who obviously uh, lifted that trophy with that team just this past June. Two countries. Really cool stuff. So Two yeah. countries. Yeah. 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 Team yeah, USA, really cool team stuff team there, team. obviously. And yeah, so really cool stuff there, obviously. Ryan will get the chance to talk to. Um, obviously somebody who just knows the team very well and, and Nicole Mendez all the time, but then obviously players, maybe Patty at some point, I assume, um, kind of just, you know, extra stuff. So that's gonna be really cool. Um, kind of, a you know, using, using Ryan's second resource there to help us, uh, with a little, little extra softball coverage. So that can only be a good thing. Oh, you softball fans are incredibly rabid and care about that team. It, it's football. And softball, they're basically on the same level as far as, you know, I can tell in, in terms of the fan support and how much they care about those teams. So we're going to have lots of softball coverage this season as that team tries to go back to back. Yeah, I'd, I'd characterize it this way. The, the football is 12 months out of the year, 365 days. The softball is also 12 months out of the year, 365 days, but doesn't start to peak until World Series time, postseason time. That's when I've that's what I noticed last year covering the team during the season. Everybody's happy. Everybody's good. Everybody's fired up. Once the postseason got here, everything changed for that softball team coverage wise. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be another fun season ahead. Uh, Ryan, you can talk about, you know, real briefly if you want, just they're number one in everything. Um, since our last <laughs> show, the polls, every poll comes out the number one, obviously the number one in the baseball preseason poll. Um, Oklahoma State's right there with them. I mean, they're number, they're in the top five in every poll. They kind of bounce around where they are, but they're always in the top five, number two in the Big 12. But obviously, the Big 12 and college softball in general again runs through Oklahoma. D1 softball, USA. There, I saw another poll. They're number one in all of them. Going to be an amazing team again. They don't, they didn't lose that much from last year's team. It's a lot of the same people back. So they, uh, they should be an amazing team again. Yeah, Josh, they literally lost three contributors. They lost Nicole Mendez, who I guess we'll get to see her work through not being on the field with them firsthand. They lost Giselle Juarez. Yeah, and they lost, forever, so yeah, and they lost Shannon Sale, who is right back as a, a grad, an assistant on staff now. So uh, replace them with you got an Alyssa Brito, the Oregon transfer coming in, um, who will work in the field. Her bat will be very valuable. Then you've got. Jordy Ball, the the all world freshman pitcher, and then Hope Troutwine coming from North Texas. So uh, they they were able to yeah. reload on the spots that they lost, which is why they're the unanimous number one team everywhere you look. Uh, should be a fun year though, like you mentioned. Oklahoma State's also in the top five, Texas in the top fifteen. So that should be a three way race there as far as Big Twelve play, and then 
Uh, UCLA, also a preseason top five team. Oklahoma will link up with them in the non-conference. I believe that's on the same day that OU Kansas happens, February 12th at, uh, not February 12th. Anyway. Uh, that's we're, right. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, that it, is right. February yeah, 12th. it'll it, th- they'll play them pretty quickly here. Sorry if I got all of my wires crossed there on when exactly, but but that is something that'll be rolling right. out pretty quick. So it, it should be pretty interesting. If you're listening to this on Thursday, softball media days today. So head over to the site because there's stuff up there now. Right. Looks like the season starts February 10th. Yeah, yeah. Is that the UC Santa Barbara? Yeah, that's UC Santa Barbara. Uh, UC Santa Barbara. I think they hit UCLA on their second trip out to the West Coast, so it wouldn't be the 12th. I'm just dumb. Don't mind me. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, I was talking uh, at at uh, basketball. I think maybe the Baylor game or the Kansas game, I can't remember which one, uh, to Patrick Dunn, obviously a good friend of uh, of the show, Swapel SID, and he was like, yeah, we're going to California and Hawaii and just like all these tropical places, and it was like, you suck. I would love to do that. <laughs> They're also it's going so to Houston. Cold and it's hey, brutal. it's not too late. You can send me to Hawaii, boss. You can send Josh and I to Hawaii. We need video and we need print <laughs> copy. You can send us both out there if you'd like. Gosh. I might send you guys to Houston. That's doable. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants to go to Houston. <laughs> Back down <laughs> South Texas. More South Texas. Didn't get enough at the, uh, the Alamo Bowl. Yeah, we'll um, hit up Shake Shack without you. So yeah. Oh gosh, that Shake Shack was so good. <laughs> it was really I think good. I thought about it the other day. Like it really, like it was a passing thought in my brain. Like how Josh good thinks that about was. Shake Shack. Like <laughs> <laughs> legitimately, legitimately. And if you're not familiar with the name Hope Troutwine, by the way, she was one who threw the perfect game for North Texas. So yeah, rich get richer there. As if, as if that's fair. The rest of the country, I imagine the rest of the country when she announced OU was just like. This is stupid. Like they just <laughs> sat back like that's not fair at all. So, well, the funny um, thing too is they have coming up. Yeah, Patty Gasso all last year talked about how the pitchers were just getting dominated in practice, basically, and it was a battle mentally to get them back ready to face other lineups. Uh, Patty told me basically, yeah, uh, our hitters are just getting dominated every single day in practice. Like they can't touch Nicole May, Jordy Ball, or Hope Troutline. So, uh, best lineup ever Crazy. in the history of the sport. And uh, they can't touch the new pitching staff. <laughs> nuts. Wow. Going to be a nuts team again. They were nuts last year. Have a chance to be even more so, which is a crazy to think about. The season, like we said, it's coming up very quickly. Like, a, you know, Diamond Sports, they always they feel like they're further away than they are. Then all of a sudden, they're just they're here. That, that's yeah. how it is. Same thing with baseball. They start the season February 18th um, at Global Life Fielding is Auburn. I'm planning to be down there for that. So that'll be pretty cool. Uh, some big baseball games to start the season. Um, did have Peyton Graham, third baseman, was named all Big 12 preseason today. So going to be excited to see what he can do. Had a really good season last year. We'll see how he kind of builds on it going into next year. What's well, a really big year for Skip Johnson and that baseball program. Try and get things back on track. And, you know, we're all excited for the SEC move in football, but the SEC move in the Diamond Sports. Like the, the the preseason poll for softball, it had like eight or nine SEC teams. Like I can't wait to watch OU play a schedule like that in softball, especially baseball. They got to step up in a big way before they handle that. But softball to play premier teams every weekend, essentially, is going to be really really cool. Especially at the new stadium, that's going to be yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be a tough uh, trip for for Skip and those guys uh, if he's still around. Got to, a lot to improve to go yeah. into the SEC and handle that kind of schedule, man. That's going to be – you talk about a murderer's row. Whew. Seriously. I mean, if you're not familiar, there are times last season where the, the top ten was seven, eight SEC teams. And it is insane. There is nobody that's cool. not good in that league. It's 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 seriously nuts. So um, certainly going to be a tough, tough do. But honestly, you just you got to build it up. Got to build the program. The team a couple years ago probably was good enough to handle it. Team last year, not so much. So just kind of find that consistency for that program going to be obviously really, really important. All right. That's it. Got, you have something you want to add? I got one to? note for you. We, sure. we we sold our readers short. We did our readers uh, and listeners a disservice, which is months ago, we made our picks for college football. And I wrote them down. Oh. And I put them on a sticky note right oh, over my God. desk. Oh, and God. here they are. We don't want to even see this. This is shameful. This is shameful. It's going to be ugly. Yeah. <laughs> we it's going to be ugly. Okay. Let's just go right across the list. I'll go my, my pick first. Ryan's pick second. Josh's pick third. Big 12. 
OU, OU, OU. Oops. Eh. They weren't even in the game. All right. Pac-12. Oregon, USC, Oregon. Yeah. No, they didn't win. They didn't win. I <laughs> no, they, they didn't did. win. They, did not. Not. they were in the game, though. They're at least in the game. <laughs> Big Ten Conference, Ohio State across the board. Alabama across the board in the SEC. All right, we got one. We got one. We On got the board. one. We got one. Yeah, we know what we're talking about with the SEC. Uh, <laughs> the ACC, I picked Clemson. Ryan picked North Carolina, <laughs> which will be hands down the worst pick on here. Although USC, Ryan, yeah, I was about that to was say, terrible too. Yeah, USC. USC won four I, games. I drank the Clay Helton Kool Aid. Yes, uh, that was and, yeah. Ryan Loki predicted Lincoln to USC before anybody knew yeah, anything. Uh, you heard That's it here it. first. That must be it. Uh, and Josh picked Clemson. So yeah, we whiffed on three of the five conferences and by whiff, I mean, didn't come close to anybody. Right. Oh well, we, knew, we, knew, we knew our league, the SEC, we knew our, the league yes, we cover. Yes, we, the league we, we cover, cover. yes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, for the playoff, I picked Oklahoma, Alabama, Ohio State, and Clemson. And, um, Ryan picked Alabama, Georgia, well done, North Carolina, and OU, a little less well done. Halfway and, uh, there. Josh picked, yeah, Josh picked Alabama, Clemson, Oklahoma, and Ohio State. And then under where it says NC for national champions, I didn't write anything. I didn't <laughs> write down our pick for who won the national championship. So I'm just going to say I picked uh, Georgia, even though I, I didn't pick them to go to the playoff. <laughs> I, I definitely picked Alabama. No, I, 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 I remember I this conversation. I remember this conversation. Josh picked Alabama. Uh, Hoove and I both picked Alabama and Oklahoma in the national championship game. Hoove yeah. was on when we did this, he was on the I did write the column that Oklahoma was ready to win the national championship, but he had taken a step off it and went with Alabama. And my I yeah. went with Oklahoma saying, surely Alabama can't win every year. So uh, a lot of half truths in there. And uh, as a whole, we Which- all sucked. This entire thing deserves an asterisk because hey, if we had known that Lincoln had a foot out the door, we would we wouldn't have picked what we did. That's, like, that's the end all that you can put on everything last year. Is well, I didn't know that Lincoln was the lead. Right? Like, if he was gonna if he was gonna finish the season as the head coach, right, and not be thinking about USC, maybe he beats Oklahoma State. Maybe they beat Baylor. Maybe they go to the playoff. Maybe they win a national championship. Probably not, yeah. but maybe. Well, I don't know. You guys, when Spencer thinking. Rattler was. The clear Heisman favorite and number one pick. Yeah, yeah. easy. Eons and ago. lost his job long ago. Eons ago. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I also I've... wrote on this list. Uh, I also wrote Mike Woods and four first second round. I have no idea what that means. Uh, the bot, <laughs> but that's at the bottom of my note. Taking, I just I suck at taking notes, so I didn't Mike even write Woods. the national champion picks down. But I pick, I wrote that down for some reason. I'll be in charge of uh. taking the notes this next off season. I'll take that charge. Okay, you got it. Sounds good, even though it'll age poorly again. <laughs> North Carolina, USC Trojans. What's funny about North Carolina is that that went sideways the first weekend. Maybe I know they lost that, to was, South Carolina. that was my like the very, <laughs> the very Carolina, first weekend. I was to, uh, Virginia Tech. Yeah, the very first weekend I was like the Sam Howell hype train. I am selling all stock. I have all of it. I've got all the stock in the country. I'd like to sell it all. Anyone wants any? Yeah, they lost to Virginia Tech like that first like Friday, like not even the first Saturday. It was like, all right, <laughs> UNC is already out. <laughs> we hadn't had a weekend yet. Man, so hard to predict. I remember I had Perry on Winfrey winning the Big Twelve Defensive Player of the Year. That didn't work out either. Yeah, that's another one. So I think we made like bold predictions, which yours might have been something with Mike Woods, but you didn't say anything beyond just Mike Woods on your note. I think I said Mike Woods was going to break more chin straps than anybody else in the Big Twelve. I don't think that panned out either. No. He'd not. be the first player. Maybe your bold prediction was he'll be the first player to ever do the Kansas State hand sign upside down, which I saw him do. <laughs> I'd never seen anybody do that before. He was going off the field, and he was like – I was like, he just did the K-State hand sign upside down. Well, seen he'd like get he down for the K-State thing. At least he didn't call it the par- Prairie on the Palace. <laughs> prairie on the Palace. Oops. Who said that? Who was that again? That would be uh, Latrell McCutcheon via Hayes Foster. Latrell McCutcheon. Right, right. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. <laughs> wonderful things. What a, what a team. What a team. Good memories. 2021. Good memories. <laughs> Turn the page. <laughs> Turn the page. <laughs> All righty. That's it for us. We'll uh, catch you next time. 
Of course, we'll be back next week. I absolutely will not guarantee that Caleb Williams or Jackson Dart has made a decision by then because <laughs> I'm 0 for 2 on doing that. You assume they will, but I thought that the last couple of times. So who knows? Let's talk about the latest of the basketball teams, all the latest of the football teams. As we move into the month of February, which is signing day, spring ball gets closer and closer. It'll be that spring game before you even know it, uh, guaranteed. So we're getting closer to all that good stuff. You can catch that show and all the shows, of course, on the SI, uh, on allcenters.com, on iTunes, Spotify, Google, iHeart, wherever you get your podcasts. If you have an Amazon able device, just say Alexa, play the SI Sooners podcast. It's also posted on our website, like I said, allcenters.com. You can, just, you can just click on the player and listen on your phone, your tablet, or your computer. For Ryan Chapman and John Hoover, I'm Josh Calloway. We'll catch you guys next time.